Merci beaucoup. Um, here I am doing my knitting and my reading my book. <laughs> so I'm trying to get organised for my trip home. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just, uh, I feel a little embarrassed now because I said, oh, I don't have that much to say. <laughs> And uh, I just heard this is the most important part of the day. <laughs> so, I, so I better think of something. Um, a, a couple of things. Um, one is, of course, parents are very important. And it's very difficult when you're doing population measures to, um, ooh, to understand um, where the parents sit in the picture. And it was interesting when Lynn was talking about uh, the collection of data in Alberta, because in Australia we have a very 95% particip particip participation um, from the schools and the children, and we have passive consent, which uh, has been very successful. If we were to make it active consent, I suspect because the teachers are filling in the questionnaire, it would be more difficult um, for us to have such a high participation rate. Um, so, because it's a population measure, we do this. But the other thing we do is we collect information from parents in their first year of school, and that questionnaire is called the School Entrant Health Questionnaire. And this questionnaire is confidential, and we have consent from the parents. We have uh, voluntary participation of between 85 to 90 per cent of all parents. They consent. Um, for the data to be used for research purposes. And because it's the first year of school and because parents are so optimistic, I think, when their children first start school, the information that they provide is extraordinary. Uh, the questionnaire um, asks many questions which are a little different from the EDI. There is a lot of demographic information. We ask about uh, chronic illness. We ask um, about, ac uh, we look at access to services. Uh, it includes the strength and difficulty questionnaire, the SDQ. Um, it also has a very good uh, set of questions around speech, language and communication. Uh, I'll send this questionnaire to um, Julie and May and uh, to Bertrand and Natalie um, and if anybody else would like it, I'm very happy for you to have a copy. Um, but this questionnaire has actually helped us a lot. It started back in 1997. And, it, um, and the parents fill this information out. And we have school nurses. And the school nurses distribute the questionnaire when they go to the school. And they pick up the questionnaire. And then they follow up the children. The problem with that questionnaire was that the nurses said it was an instrument for them. And they didn't share it with anyone. And so for teachers who spend up to eight hours a day with children in school, <laughs> It was quite difficult, I could see, um, for them not to have any feedback. So eventually, over time, um, this was my first project in government, um, was to actually review the do a run a technical review of this questionnaire. But this questionnaire has been extremely helpful because you have the parents' perspective on uh, conditions, chronic conditions, um, concern, family history, um, uh, poor experiences in families, uh, current stress, uh, speech and language, uh, mental health, uh, speech and language, vision, hearing, etc., 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 and they're validated questions. We have uh, we try and use the same questions they use in the longitudinal studies, so there is some sort of overlap. And what we have done uh, in the province of Victoria um, is we have been able to link the parents' data to the teachers' data, and then we've been able to link that to the achievement data that's collected in schools. Uh, Martin, um, some of you may know about the Middle Development Index, which is another questionnaire. And we've introduced that into some of our schools. And we're linking that data too. So having this data from different people is really terribly important and has really helped us to clarify the picture of what's happening with our children um, before school, at school, you know, once they start school. Um, it's important now for us to understand uh, the peaks and troughs during adolescence. But in terms of responding to the EDI, I think I mentioned on a number of occasions that the local communities um, volunteer to be champions. And uh, many of the projects that are run uh, that are where, uh, where um, parents are engaged are managed by those communities. 
So it's the community engagement um, and the community work is uh, extremely um, helpful in those who are working in policy um, when we're trying to understand parents' response, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I won't talk any more about parents. I'll leave this to Martin and um, to Lynn because they have uh, much more to say. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think some of the things I'm going to say are similar to what I've said before in terms of um, making personal connections. Uh, I can't say that I talk to parents as often as I do to um, professionals in the ECD field or teachers or people in, the, in different levels of government. But at the end of the day, of course, many people who work in these areas are also parents. And then there's sometimes there are audiences or groups where you have a mix of all of those different stakeholder groups. <clears throat> and um, a couple of the things are echoing what um, Kathy just said um, in terms of um, parents want to know information about their own children. They're really keen on getting information on their own children and they want to s contextualize that in regard to how all the other kids are doing. You know, this, is this, you know, something that I should be expecting? Is this good or bad how my child is doing? And uh, what are the things that other people are doing in order to help with development or to teach or to support and what have you? Um, so that's very, that's, People want to get that information. So there's, again, there's a natural interest usually. What's also there is there's a huge interest in um, among the parents to talk about their own children. And often to the extent, again, similar experience as in Australia. Um, first, whenever you develop a new questionnaire or whenever you come up with a new project, we, I, I'm not sure if this is uh, common for all of us, but you often think about the potential barriers and the potential things that could go wrong, which is, of course, is really fundamentally important. You want to make sure you're not um, 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 ruining your project by doing the wrong thing. But a lot of people said, well, if we ask um, the parents all this information, it's going to be too sensitive, it's going to be too personal. But you, the reality is, if you have them in an environment where they feel safe, usually they tell you much more than you ever expected. You know, the, the reality is usually you think, okay, we have five or ten minutes, and then an hour later, you're still talking about the development of their children. In many cases, that's, uh, that's the case. So there's a huge need. Uh, not among just among teachers and the professionals, in the, uh, but also among the parents to talk about their own children and see how they're doing and what they can do to support their to support their uh, support their children. And I'll just show you um, maybe a, a couple of maps and show you one other piece in terms of presenting the information. Yeah, if if, you, if that's okay, we'll go back to the slideshow. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you can't do it from your computer. <laughs> yeah, and if we go here. I'll So here's again, here's um, uh, Coquitlam, the same city I showed you before. So often the first stage I find when you do these presentations where you have parents or um, first you present the information and of course you try to explain it well. Often what happens when you go through these different stages of presenting, at least that's how we have often done it, um, at first there's just this you know, neutral curiosity about what's going to come. But then the moment you go through the different domains and do that, put that on the maps, people start to see certain patterns and you create, their, you create a certain sense of curiosity about why those, parent, those patterns exist. So I'll just go through an example with showing you some different maps. Um, and then we, we can you know, briefly maybe see if there are certain patterns that emerge. And then the next question is how do you potentially explain these patterns based on other information we may have as researchers, but then also on the information that the, the parents bring to this. So and let me just, yeah. So here's the one um, map for social competence in your community. And if you, here's a map again where you, uh, green means good, green means that there's relatively low vulnerability. Um, the neutral, um, 
or sorry, then the yellow color means that you're somewhat in the middle range in terms of vulnerability. So do I have a mouse? Does it show? Yeah, here. Yeah. So here you see the green one is uh, zero to five percent vulnerability, and then the light green is six to eight percent. Very few children who are vulnerable on this particular domain. Then you get to nine to ten percent for the yellow, and the darker the red, the more children are vulnerable. So you very quickly see, looking just at the map, and again you have seen this uh, in, in principle before, you very quickly see where the neighborhoods are where there is more need in terms of social competence and the ones that are doing relatively well. And often you also see that some of these neighborhoods are right next to each other. So Como Lake right here is doing relatively well, and then right, right next to it you have another neighborhood that's not doing so well. So you immediately create curiosity. What is it that people right next door are doing so differently? And people can contextualize because they live there. And then, but this is just one of the domains. This is just social competence. And then, as I showed you before, if there are follow-up questions on what are we actually measuring, we can go back to the list of items that the teacher is actually filling out. So you, that's what I mean by s slowly building the, the the more differentiated story. And then you go to the next. <clears throat> so just take a try to remember a little bit of the snapshot here. You have a couple of neighborhoods on the upper left um, here that are looking quite favorable. <laughs> and then in the middle center here, you have some that are red, and then there's another one green over here. And then you go to the next domain, emotional maturity. You know, it's slightly different, but still in the upper left, there's some green. This one is green again. In the middle, we have some are red. <clears throat> so you start to see, okay, is the pattern for the different domains, is it similar or is it different? Um, then again, you can explain of some of the measures that were, so in the first one we looked at whether children um, um, listen in the classroom, whether they um, um, respect others and so forth. Um, um, and then, or whether what their overall social competence is, whether they get along with other kids, and then when it comes to emotional maturity, it's about their anxiety, their aggression, and so forth. So you, you, you look at these different domains, put them side by side, is this pattern similar or not? Then you go to the next domain, language and cognitive development, and again, you, you look at the different patterns, and then apart, there are two things happening. There is a sense, people are developing a sense for the pattern, but then imagine you live in one of these neighborhoods. You look at how your own neighborhood looks in terms of all these five domains and compare it to the other. So you're doing two things. You give an overall pattern and people, and I mean, that's not something you have to do by explaining it for e each individual community, but that's people what they usually do. They focus on their own community and try to l set that in relation to the others. So you go through all these five different um, uh, to all the five different domains of the EDI, people start to say uh, to see patterns. And then the question is, let's say for the communication skill, you see a community that's very different uh, in terms of vulnerability and communication than some of the others. And then some of the parents may say, well, we have a lot of uh, immigrant children in that. So it makes complete sense that there's children struggling with the language of instruction because they just came to the country. Um, but yes, we know from experience that they're... Uh, so they, they immediately try to validate the findings, the patterns they see with their own experience, but then often they're also going to be surprises. And that's where it's often helpful then to bring in complementary information. And let me just see if I have it in the right order here. Um, go back up. One question that often is asked, how does it relate to the socioeconomic resources in the community? So for all of our neighborhoods, we produce a map where you have um, three categories of socioeconomic status. I keep losing my mouse right here. And so the dark blue means that's uh, those are the neighborhoods with the highest socioeconomic status. So, for example, here Lincoln Park and Anmore Pleasant Site, they're the ones. They're two neighborhoods that have relatively high socioeconomic status, relatively high income, relatively high proportion of people with um, higher education degrees, uh, larger employment rates, and so forth, as opposed to the ones that have the medium blue or the light blue. So now you start contextualizing the information with what are the, some of the resources that are in the community. And depending on what other information you have, and I'll just show you one example of what we have done in BC in particular, we have asked the children themselves, not the same age, but this is older children, this is grade four children, we ask them about how happy they are and whether they're happy with their life, whether they're anxious or not, whether they have high self-esteem or not. So, and this is coming back to what Kathy said earlier, 
the EDI is one piece of the puzzle. And you see a pattern within the EDI. Often people want to ask about socioeconomic resources. That's a very common question. They ask about sometimes about cultural questions. I, I gave you an example of that. But then sometimes the question is, well, this is teacher's ratings. How does it relate to some other information we may have? And again, this sometimes you have that expertise or that knowledge in the communities and it comes out in those discussions and the parents have a sense. I mean, so it's, for us as researchers, it's absolutely instrumental that we get our hypotheses validated or developed by the people who live in the communities. So we continuously take that into account when we do our research analyses. But of course, we may also have our own access to other data. So in this particular case, we ask the kids whether they're happy or not. We also ask them in terms of their adult relationships, whether they feel connected to their adults in the community, whether it's at home or in the school or in the neighborhood. And so you look at the patterns from, from the EDI and you compare that to com patterns on, let's say, the census information, or in this particular case, we have a youth survey. We ask them about their assets, their context, and their own well-being. And you put, start putting all these pieces together and now you're slowly able to tell a more differentiated story about the children within your community. And that's usually what I find interests the parents the most because then they can relate the outcomes they're seeing to some of the resources and the assets that are in their community. And they can start making sense and come up with some implications of, okay, what are some of the things we may want to do um, differently? What are some of the things we may want to address? Or what are the things that we can maybe celebrate or build on because we're really looking strong and sh maybe even share with other communities? So that I found in, in, in talking to communities in general, but parents specifically, if you're able to contextualize the information on the EDI to some of the things that are surrounding that in the community, you give them a more fulsome story, and then you tie that to their own experiences, and that's where usually you have the most, um, that's where you have a discussion, the communication story, as we said earlier, uh, that's where you have the most fruitful um, conversations usually happening, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and pass it on, thanks. Thank you. I think you have a lot of things to I do? Yeah. yeah? That's what you said. I do have a lot of stuff to say. <laughs> well, community development is my area, right? That's yeah. what I've been doing for the last five years. So, um, okay, where do we start? <laughs> um, so, I think one of the things we learned through our project was that if you wanted to engage parents, one of the things you had to do was uh, look at what's going to bring them to the table, especially if you want them to participate as collaborators on coalitions, committees, or um, partenariat. Huh? Is that what you call them here? Yeah. So um, oftentimes what we found would happen is that people would have meetings in the middle of the afternoon when parents couldn't participate, and uh, or if they had them in the evening, they kept asking, well, how come parents aren't coming to the table? How come parents aren't engaged? Well, guess what? Maybe they've got young kids at home and they can't come, or they don't have access to transportation. Maybe you're holding your meetings too far out, or maybe you're holding it in a location that has a stigma attached to it. So instead of asking why are parents not coming, ask them why they're not coming, and then take those barriers down. And that became really... Um, really important. And it wasn't just about asking. So we've all been in the position where somebody says, okay, who wants to volunteer for this? Yeah, this is usually the response you get. Uh, <laughs> so everybody just kind of starts looking down, avoiding eye contact, looking outside, <laughs> because people don't know what to do with that. Um, and there's probably maybe 10 of you that would love to participate. I was a stay-at-home mom when my kids were young. Um, I loved participating in stuff, but the things that got me out, the things that got me to contribute were when people actually asked me personally. But not just, hey, we need, we need a body, or we need a, a representative. Um, it was, you know what? You are really good at talking with people. Would you mind coming and doing presentations? Or would you mind contributing this skill set? And so one of the things we did right from the beginning was um, tell people, if you want parents to participate, leverage the gifts of hands, head, and heart. Everybody has something to bring to the table. Our role, I think, as professionals is to create the space for it. Um, 
a perfect example. I was at one meeting, and um, I was sharing this earlier. I was at one meeting, and everybody started introducing themselves, and they were the director of this, and the manager of this, and you know, and then they get to the parent, who by then is completely intimidated, um, and trying to figure out, well, what do I manage? <laughs> well, a household and kids, that's pretty damn important, right? Um, so it's put yourself on, a, on an even level playing field with parents. Even the score right from the beginning so that their voice has equal power at the table. So they don't feel intimidated. And then give them a role to play, not just a place to sit. So they're not just occupying a chair when they come to the table, they're actually playing an important role. Um, so that's kind of the overall general idea of sort of mobilizing parents. But now I, what I want to do is give you some examples of things we did that helped um, engage the community um, strategically targeting parents. Um, so the first one. First one's a great story. It was uh, down south in a little community in rural Alberta. And um, in this community, there was a brand new park, a uh, play park, you know, where kids could go on swings and do all that stuff. And it was beautiful. I mean, state of the art. The, the town had spent a lot of money on this. Nobody was going. Nobody. It was empty. You could drive at any time of the day, and that park was empty. So when the coalition decided to go to the parents and ask them, how come nobody goes to that park? One of the things they found out was that before the park was built, it used to be um, a doggy, doggy play park, you know, where you take your dogs? Well, guess what? Guess what all the dogs were doing before there was a park? They were doing it after there was a park, <laughs> in the park. And so parents didn't want their kids to go play in the sand when there was doggy poo-poo all over the place. So what did the coalition do? So, and, and parents had been advocating for this, but couldn't find a voice. They couldn't find a vehicle uh, to the city council, but the coalition could. Um, so the coalition worked with parents, and then they said, well, how can we build a little capacity in the community? So they got the girl guides involved and the Boy Scouts to create signs for the park, and then they had a doggy doo doo pickup day. <laughs> Um, where, to, I'd love to hear how that's translated. <laughs> that was just an aside. Anyways, so, so they had a doggy pickup day. They had the town donate hot dogs and barbecues. They had the food. You brought your own pickup instrument, whatever you felt comfortable with in terms of how close you got to the doggy doo-doo. And within a day, they had that part cleaned up. And then they created some sustainability because they had the Girl Guides and the Boy Scouts create signs. And then they had the buy-in from City Council because City Council said, hey, this coalition can really mobilize a community. So anyways, I know you're all in awe, right? I mean, it's such a simple story. We think that changing the world needs to be like this big, but it really doesn't. You know, having a clean park at the end of the day matters to those moms and dads that are taking the children there. And that's what matters. It's the little things, the little, the little baby steps that we take. Uh, another one was, uh, we have one community that re was really fighting with literacy. And um, so they connected with firefighters. Now, as you well know, firefighters in a lot of communities, we have a lot of volunteer firefighters and uh, where they have to be on call. And they have a lot of free time. Because let's face it, in small communities, you're not fighting fires 24-7. Uh, and so... They, would, they got together with the firefighters and got the firefighters to connect with the libraries and go in, take turns whenever they had time, and go in and read in uniform. Now you tell me that didn't get the mothers going to the library. <laughs> so, and the nice thing about that is... Uh, well, uh, yeah, the, well, the kids accompanied the mothers, but <laughs> we're talking about parent engagement. <laughs> Uh, so, but the firefighters went in uniform. That was an important piece of it as well. It wasn't just that they were disguised as regular people. We had them disguised as firefighters because in the eyes of a child, a firefighter is a hero, always. And so it became this, this really big deal that a firefighter was reading to them. Um, 
Another example, I'm, I'm just giving you snapshots. I told you I had lots to say. <laughs> uh, just cut me off whenever, no. or else I'll talk all day. Um, so another example is that as professionals, we have a lot of access to uh, good quality professional development. We get speakers coming in and we have access to people that will inspire us and motivate us. Well, your average mom and dad in the community that's not working in the field rarely has access to that. Um, so our coalitions took some of those dollars at the community level and they brought in some really inspirational speakers. So we had people like Jeff Johnson, who's a play guru, um, come in. And one of the things that the communities did was, because uh, we're always thinking about capacity building, right? How do, we, how do we take this and then sort of explode it out? Um, so one community in particular brought in Jeff Johnson to speak to parents about messy play. Uh, but then they also invited all the young teenagers in the community that had taken the babysitting course and got them involved. And we gave them front row seats so that they were the special guests because guess what? Those are the parents of tomorrow. So we're building capacity right from the ground up. Um, and, and we did this in small communities. So it wasn't, let's bring Jeff Johnson into Edmonton, uh, you know, where we get lots of that kind of stuff. It was, let's bring Jeff Johnson into little communities so that parents don't have to drive really far. And for those that wanted to come from far away, the coalition paid for buses that brought them in, and we paid for childcare, so that there was childcare on site, so that both mom and dad could come. And that's a really important piece around engaging fathers, is what's preventing dads from participating. Well, when you have a male presenter presenting on play, it's probably a little more attractive than having a female presenter present on play, right? So it's looking at always having sort of um, representational demographics in terms of people presenting the information. Um, language. That's a huge one. I mean, even coming here, and it's funny because it's like this all over the country. We love acronyms. A, B, C, E, D, I, E, M, D, B, E. Like, we just use them and we throw them around like everybody should know what they are. Well, when you're having a meeting and you're bringing parents to that or you want to engage parents, get rid of those. I know it's hard, but it's not going to kill you to say the full word. <laughs> I guarantee it. Um, and, and it'll further your agenda in connecting with parents. So we have to be careful about the language we use when we're inviting parents to participate. And on that note, I think one of the other really... Um, really important things, is that we have to stop making parents victims. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's like that here, but in Alberta, there's kind of this culture of, well, parents can't parent unless they've, they've got programs and services. We have to tell them how to do it. How else are they going to know? And how come they're not coming to our centers and taking these parent classes? Well, you know what? I raised three kids quite well, actually. And and I didn't even know what attachment was. So, and they all turned out perfectly fine um, with you know, the nice ratio of challenges in their life to make them resilient um, and to make me resilient. But I think we have to stop victimizing parents and thinking that they're patients that need fixing. Right? So when we, when we invite them to the table, it's not because we want to teach them something, it's because they just might have something to teach us as professionals. And that's the lens we should always be wearing, that their voice is equal to ours. Uh, what other? Oh, OK. Uh, we had, I'm just looking at my notes here, just to see what I want to talk about. We've got, uh, we did a lot of parent conferences. Uh, and these were conferences that were held very similar to what our own professional development, prof you know, professional conferences would look like in terms of having speakers and um, having resources. 
uh, having the ability to connect to resources in the community. So a lot of our communities across Alberta decide to hold parent conferences. And what they would do at those is not only bring in inspirational speakers um, that would sort of share information, but also bring other people in the community, in that community, um, to, to talk about what was there. One of the things we're not very good at is mobilizing local knowledge. We always think the further away it comes, the better it must be. And, and in Canada, the further away is Australia. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, and that's not denying all the wonderful things we've actually adopted and begged and borrowed from Australia. But we have a wealth of resources ourselves. Um, not only nationally or provincially, but also locally. And oftentimes, there's a lot of people locally that can contribute. And it's so much better to pull it locally when you're trying to build local coalitions uh, for one simple reason. It starts connecting people. And they have relationships. And they start seeing them, you know, each other in the grocery store. And so when you invite them to participate on a conversation around early childhood, they're much more likely to get engaged if they know, oh yeah, I met that person at that, at that parent fair or that parent conference. Um, one of the other things we did to mobilize uh, parents as well was uh, a lot of communities had three-year-old parties. Um, do you use the ASQ here? Ages and stages questionnaire, yeah. Pas partout, mais assez. So there, um, in Alberta, it's used quite uh, widely in health centers. But sometimes getting parents to health centers after the child is 18 months is really difficult because they just don't go. Um, so, and let's face it, if you put an ad in the paper and say, hey, come get your child screened, yeah, not too many people are going to come on a Saturday. But if you say, hey, we're having a three-year-old party um, and we're going to bring in lots of resources from the community, lots of play activities, things that you can do with your child, and, oh, by the way, you can stop at this table and get your three-year-old um, ASQ to give you more information on their developmental trajectory, uh, then people participate and they, and they come out. And in some of the communities, it's actually been really interesting because... When we've aggregated um, the ASQ and looked at the results, it mirrored what we were finding on the EDI two years later. So just a little piece of a side. Um, yeah, which was really interesting. I'm trying to think of all the other things that... Um, I know there's some things... Oh, well, the Conversation Cafe I talked about a little bit yesterday, right, where we had the couch in the mall, uh, and that's been replicated in a lot of different uh, ways to actually go where the parents are. Um, one of the things we don't do very well is actually go where they are. A and let's face it, and sometimes you have a captive audience. Um, we have a registration. I, soccer is really, really big in, in Alberta. And um, during the spring and the fall, we have registration periods. Registration for indoor soccer, registration for outdoor soccer. Now, in a place like Edmonton, the lineup to register your child can be three hours long. And you're not moving because you don't want to lose your place in line. So guess what? That is a perfect opportunity to talk to parents. <laughs> they're in line. Um, Right? And they're just looking for something that'll, you know, take them out of that boredom of waiting in line. So d there's a perfect opportunity to capture them and give them some information, connect them to resources. More importantly, some of the things that we can do is also talk to coaches, mentors, people that work with children um, in those informal ways to talk about social and emotional development. Uh, recreation is a big part of children's lives, and so if we can teach coaches um, to take up the opportunity that they have these little ones, uh, you know, under their thumb for an hour, two hours a week, and that while they're building physical skills, they can also build social and emotional skills in terms of learning how to play together and share and good team spirit and supporting one another. I mean, those are all skill sets that kill kids will need later on. 
but that sometimes people don't necessarily deliberately think that they can do. So um, I'll leave time for questions. Yeah.